Okay, so thank you very much, Mike, and uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. It's the first time I'm Trieste, but of course I know about this workshop, so it's uh, very interesting to be here. So um, I'm interested with solid-liquid interfaces in the context of electrochemistry. And these are some of the examples where electrochemistry is important. It's certainly a very small portion of the places where solid-liquid inter, uh, solid inter, interfaces are important. And uh, if we want to kind of tune or enhance the functionality of any of these kind of processes or even try uh, to un maybe suppress corrosion, then we need, of course, to understand the underlying mechanism starting from the atomistic scale and really knowing what's going on. Density functional theory has been extremely helpful in providing insight as complement to experiment in many kind of materials, question, materials uh, problems. And so the question is, can we also use Apinizio calculations in order to address problems in electrochemistry? Now the problem that is close to my heart is corrosion, since I'm working in an institute for iron and steel research, so obviously corrosion is an issue we have to deal with. And uh, when we are thinking about these electrochemical systems, we are facing a lot of challenges. Let me start with the example of a galvanized steel sheet, which corrodes. So the base material is steel, which in itself is extremely complicated. And what is done is to coat it with zinc, kind of as a first layer against protecting it against corrosion. Then, of course, the metals are not the thermodynamically stable state when, uh, when it comes into contact with an aqueous environment. So what happens is that we form some kind of uh, oxide, hydroxide, which hopefully has protective properties and therefore doesn't allow for further degradation of the material. Now, if we want to describe something like this, obviously we have to think of how to kind of make it into smaller pieces. So we need to translate somehow this material's complexity into representative structures that maybe we can treat at an atomistic level, at density functional theory, and then try to see what we can learn about the overall problem of electrochemistry. And the way we go about it is very often by combining density functional theory calculations with thermodynamic concept which allows us to use a kind of divide and conquer strategy and look at representative parts or structures, maybe a molecule here or the interface or defects in the, this uh, oxide layer and so on, and then connect everything via chemical potentials accounting for local equilibria, which may uh, occur in these systems. And we have worked on different parts of this interface. Uh, today I would like to talk about really the interface between water and the liquid. However, if we think about this, we have really also very different classes of materials and this imposes different challenges to density functional theory calculations. We do have metals, we do have semiconductors or insulators, and we do have water. Now let's start with water, which is probably the most obvious thing. Um, when we are thinking about an aqueous environment, we just can't do just a t equals zero calculation and just the total, uh, just the ground state search. We have to use molecular dynamics because we need free energies. And this, of course, brings us to some limitations regarding the time scales that we can address in density functional theory. And really something in the order of 100 picoseconds is a long trajectory for us. Um, when you think about water and density functional theory, probably people think, okay, we need to include Van der Waals interactions. There are ways in which we can do this nowadays. Something that is less frequently discussed is that we actually have a problem regarding the electronic structure of water. Now, here I've sketched kind of a line on, uh, uh, with respect to the vacuum level on an absolute scale, what the band gap of water is from experiment what we get out of PBE, and what we get if we use hybrid functionals. And you can see that sometimes, depending on the question we, need to, we want to address, we actually have to use hybrid functionals, and doing an MD with a hybrid functional is really a pain. It also is a problem if we have a metallic system in contact with water, because there the hybrid functionals are actually not something which you would like to use for the metallic system. And, uh, Therefore, we do have sometimes, to, we have really to worry about also level alignment because if we have an alignment that is this way, 
So this electron transfer may not happen. If it is this way, it will happen. And then this will describe very different physics or chemistry. So we may totally miss kind of a point. So we need to be very critical of the calculations that we are doing. Typical DFT codes also use periodic boundary conditions. And in some cases, this is a problem. And I will show a case where this is a, was a little bit challenging uh, to deal with periodic boundary conditions. But uh, let's come later to this. And of course, if you think about electrochemistry, the observables that are kind of which govern the processes and what is also controlled by, by experiment are pH and electrode potential. So kind of our first objective was to try to understand from a microscopic point of view what is, how can we understand pH and electrode potential. And this was based on idea of semiconductor physics. Uh, where we think of ions in water are, from a formal point of view, very similar to defects in semiconductors. So we use methodology from semiconductor physics in order to um, make a connection to pH and electrode potential based on formation energies of ions and the concentrations. Now, this is a point I won't discuss. We have here a paper where we discuss it in detail. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them later. But now I would like to talk about some more recent work and address two questions. What is the role of the solvent actually in stabilizing surfaces? So can we just do calculation with neglecting water or are we making an error there? And the second is, um, how do we treat the electrode potential in DFT? We, would, we know that uh, there is a double layer, so there is an electric field at the interface, and this will influence, of course, what happens at the surface. And this is also what experiment controls, but how do we get an up initio potential start in DFT calculations? So let's start with the first question, and this is work which was done by Su Hyun Yu, who is a PhD student in my group. And um, the way we can model water in DFT is either you know, doing the explicit calculations, which is obviously the most accurate way we would go about it, but of course the most painful way in, uh, in terms of computational time. So very often what is done in the community is that we consider maybe one or may, and lately also more water layers, but then we still have a vacuum region. Um, in later years, now, now it has become also popular to use an implicit solvent, and Nicola has done their work for a long time. Uh, and this is kind of a compromise between this thing and this thing. So what we do in an implicit solvent is we, we fill the vacuum with a dielectric continuum. Uh, it is certainly an approximation, but if we just want to look, let's say, at thermodynamic or stability at surfaces, this may be a way which, by which we can go. And so um, the knowledge that we have, actually most uh, people study uh, metals, the predominant literature is on metals, there is less literature on semiconductors, and also there is kind of a generally accepted picture that the impact of the solvent is rather small beyond specific absorption, but this has not really been proven and people kind of assume it. So we also, the question is, is this really true? And do effects beyond, let's say, specific absorption play a role. We also know that metals and semiconductors may behave in a very different way. So what we have in metal surfaces is typically that we have relaxations, but on semiconducting surfaces we do have some reconstructions which are kind of uh, you know, very often driven by the uh, attempt of the surface to remove surface charts. So their electrostatic arguments probably play a role. And uh, we know that, uh, well, there is an easy availability of uh, water um, uh, derivatives, OH and hydrogen groups. So this is typically considered as adsorbates on the surface. But if we think about the bulk water continuum, it will have, effect, what about effects of polarization or electrostatic screening, which are important there. And so we thought, OK, we won't do now an explicit calculation. We use an implicit solvent. And we consider a set of surface structures for which we can to perform two sets of calculations. One, a calculation in which we have the structure embedded in an dielectric continuum, so in an um, implicit solvent, and one in which we have the surface in contact with vacuum. 
And um, the surfaces I'll be looking at are zinc oxide polar surfaces, so I would very briefly like to tell you something about this material. It's a semiconducting material which uh, stabilizes, in, uh, which has a wurzite structure, um, and uh, which means that each oxygen and each zinc atom within the structure is tetrahedrally coordinated to its neighbor which means that in the bulk, the, each zinc atom would contribute kind of half an electron to a bond, and each oxygen atom would co contribute three half an electrons to the bond. So each bond within the bulk has two electrons, which is the maximum number of electrons you can have in order to have a stable situation. Now, when we cleave the material perpendicular to the Z direction, uh, to the C direction, then we end up with surfaces on one side which are purely zinc terminated and on the other with oxygen terminated surfaces. And I'll be looking at the zinc terminated polar 001 surface. And as indicated here, we do have each of these atoms has a dangling bond which is filled with half an electron. So we do have a surface charge uh, on this surface. And because the SP3 hybrids are kind of high in energy, oxygen hybrids are low in energy. We usually, there is a strive to transfer the zinc electron to the oxygen and thereby end up here with an empty and here with a filled dangling bond. And this is what we also find the drive reconstructions at the surface. Now we've considered various surface models here, some OH groups just saw in various coverages absorbed on the cleaved surface. There are large reconstructions which have kind of a triangular shape. Um, then we have a kind of a mixed uh, surface termination. We do have vacancy or adsorbate structures. And uh, we perform for each of these structures a calculation, DFT in vacuum, DFT with implicit solvent, and then use thermodynamic modeling as indicated here in order to evaluate the change in the Gibbs free energy. Now within this system we do have uh, a few chemical potentials we have to consider. The zinc oxide is uh, characterized by a zinc and an oxygen chemical potential, while the aqua system is characterized by hydrogen and oxygen chemical potential. So this means that we end up with uh, form, uh, form, uh, Gibbs formation energy, which is kind of dependent on three potentials, but we go, because we have um, to account for the stability of both zinc oxide and water, in the end we end up, um, we can see that uh, both the hydrogen is depending on the oxygen chemical potential and the zinc, so we end up with a situation in which we have here just the dependence on the oxygen chemical potential. And um, we can, well, we use our derivations which, uh, where we show that the hydrogen chemical potential can be expressed as a function of the electrode potential and the pH scale in order to make then a transformation and end up with the Pourbet diagram. So Pourbet diagram is an electrochemical diagram in which uh, what one sees is on one axis the electrode potential change with respect to the standard hydrogen electrode, which is the reference used in experiments, and on the other scale uh, as axis we do have the pH scale. In each of the uh, areas that you see here would correspond to the stability of one phase. Um, we built now such a Pourbet diagram once for the calculations without the solvent. You don't have to understand all the details, just what I would like you to remember that this kind of blue phases are S-cleaved surfaces with various uh, coverages of OH group on the surface, while this red surface is kind of a triangular reconstruction. Um, we do have one experiment, experiment which is at these conditions and when we compare we see that they do have here triangular reconstructions. So obviously we are not quite describing reality here. When we look at the um, surfaces in which we considered now the solvent, we do see that the first the diagram changes. So this kind of greenish and red colors are triangular reconstructions either with OH group, with hydrogen groups or without any coverage. And what we can see that now in the region where the experiment sees triangular reconstructions at the surface, we can also see within our phase diagram a triangular reconstruction at the surface. So obviously, solvation effects are important, but can we understand what do they actually do? Why, what's the underlying physics? And for this, we need to take a little bit closer look at the structure. 
Now, within this triangle layer reconstructions, we do have edges which are decorated with oxygen atoms, while the terraces have zinc atoms. And if you remember, the oxygen atoms have three half electrons per dangling bond. Zinc atoms have one half electron to dangling bond. So it would be easy if they are close by for an electron from the zinc dangling bond to go to the electron, to the oxygen dangling bond, thereby ending up with a situation where we don't have charge at the surface if we have the same number of zinc and oxygen dangling bonds. Now, if we look at the uh, electrostatic energy associated with this and the solvent, um, the solvation energy that we gain, we can see that uh, there is a correlation. Now, what happens if I have a small triangle is that this oxygen and zinc dangling bonds are close by, so it, we don't have to pay a big electrostatic penalty to transfer an electron. If we increase the triangular size, then of course the bonds are further away and therefore these uh, structures become less favorable in vacuum from an electrostatic point of view. And what the solvent does is to screen this unfavorable electrostatic interaction, thereby um, stabilizing um, structures which have a high electrostatic penalty in vacuum. There is a second effect. Now, we do have a few structures where we don't have the same number of dangling bonds uh, of zinc and oxygen. So therefore, we still retain some electrons at the surface, so these are metallic states. And what we can see, so within this plot, these are kind of metallic structure. On this side, we are structures which are, are structures which are semiconducting. And as you can see, as the structures become more semiconducting, there is also a strong gain in solvation energy, which means that in cases where well, so structures with non-metallic non surfaces are really for, favored by the solvent as compared to metallic surfaces. Um, and with this, we can kind of draw some general conclusion regarding our modeling. So in cases where we don't have metallic character and where electrostatics are important at the surfaces, considering the solvent will be important and we are actually making a big error if we do not consider it. In metallic systems where electrostatic interactions may play a less um, important role and where screening is also mediated by the substrate itself, this, if we neglect the solvent, we are actually making a lesser error. Uh, so for thermodynamic considerations, we are probably kind of can work if we just have one or two uh, water layers, though of course it will be better to do the full calculation. Um, with this, I would like to go now beyond the thermodynamic model that I described here and look also how we can uh, actually describe reactions. And for this, uh, we need to think about how to build a potential start in a DFT calculation because uh, how can we apply charge? And this is work which is done by Sudha Shansur and Ralau, who is uh, another PhD student in my group. Now let's look at what do we have in experiment. We typically ha we have an anode on one side, we do have a cathode on one side. On the other side, they have different charts so that we have a potential drop. Due to this potential drop, we may have dissociation, so the anion would move to the anode, the cation would move to the cathode. This will screen the charge on these electrodes, and what we will have is a potential drop. What is done in experiment is then is that uh, there is some charge flow, so uh, their um, electrons are provided on one side, removed from the other, so that we restore the, uh, the potential drop that we have. And this is something we would like to model. The problem is if you look just at the separated, so kind of just as a half cell, which is very often done in modeling, this is a grand canonical system, which means it's a system open to the exchange of both electrons and protons. And in a standard DFT code, this is not something that we can easily do. We need, uh, you know, a constant uh, chemical potential DFT code, which is not the standard that we have. If we, however, look at the overall system, this is a canonical system with respect to the exchange of electrons and uh, protons because what is kind of lost on one side is added on the other side. So if we were able to describe this kind of system, then maybe we can do actually an, an ap initio potential start. Now the difficulty comes that we typically have in our codes periodic boundary conditions. 
And uh, if we start with a situation where we do have two metals, we do have different Fermi energy, as we do our SEF cycles due to the periodic boundary conditions, in the end we end up with uh, kind of the same Fermi energy throughout the system, and so our field is kind of gone. So what do we do? Um, we thought about it and thought, okay, I mean, can we use the concept from semiconductor physics. In semiconductor physics, people do band gap engineering. So what if I kind of substitute my counter electrode, the one that I'm not so interested in, uh, by a semiconductor, but this is kind of a computational electrode which allows me to apply a field. And by doing this, we can, for example, apply here p-time doping, which will mean that, again, we will have then electron transfer, and what we end up with is a field. Of course, it can't dip beyond here, because then we will get field emission, so in the end, we will have a field which uh, uh, is going up to here. That's nice. We need to kind of find a suitable semiconductor. That was a hard part, really, because we thought, okay, let's take something like, let's say, aluminum nitride or one of these uh, uh, halides, which are, have big band gaps. Um, the problem is, of course, when we are doing a periodic boundary condition, we have the metal on one side we are interested in, we do have the other metal uh, or the semiconductor on the other side, they have to be uh, matched with respect to the lattice constant, which decreases the band gap. Anyway, in DFT, we do have a problem with also the band gap, so we ended up, for example, for aluminum nitrate with something that was two EV uh, wide band gap, which is definitely doesn't give us much flexibility for the variation of the potential. So we are kind of scratching our heads and uh, really thought, okay, what do we do? Let's look in Google, what is the <laughs> material which has a big band gap? And it turned out that neon is the material which has the largest band gap in nature. From an experimental point of view, this is of course not viable, but I don't care. I mean, if in, computational, this just, uh, in computational physics, this neon would be just a trick in order to have something with a large band gap. In fact, the band gap of neon is 22 EV, and even with PBE, it is still 11 EV, and it is properly aligned, so I don't care. <laughs> um, it has other advantages. So um, apart from the very large uh, band gap, neon is uh, van der Waals bonded. So it has a very small deformation potential, and in this way, actually, even by straining the uh, neon layer that we put as a counter electrode, we hardly have any deformation potential there. So the band gap stays still as big. And it is inert to the reactions with the possible solvent molecule. So it has turned out that neon is kind of the perfect counter electrode. We also checked, you know, again, alignment here, the system I was interested in, magnesium. Um, then we looked at if we have just vacuum, we have kind of the proper transfer of electrons, and uh, that we also get fields here, which are uh, according to what we would expect. What I didn't say is how we kind of introduced this charge. And this is done by something which is called pseudoatoms. People who are doing semiconductors are probably familiar with this because pseudoatoms is something which we use on the backside of the slab in order to saturate dangling bonds. So probably hydrogen three quarters or one half or something is familiar to you. And we use here exactly the same trick. So we have actually pseudo neon atoms. This has the advantage that we are not bound to changing the charge just by integer numbers, but we can change it also by fractional numbers, and in this way, we are much closer to the experimental situation. And uh, the, what we did is to use, uh, so the way we implemented this is actually not to change anything in VASP, which we use, but we have kind of a loop around VASP, uh, basically by a Python script, which was done in our uh, serial master model Pyron, and uh, we then check for the, um, you know, whether the potential drops had changed uh, compared to what we would like to have, and then we supply charge depending, uh, you know, such that we keep a constant potential drop. Now, um, with this, I would like to show you one application where we have used this approach to show you that this is extremely useful and we can really solve problems with this. And this is looking at magnesium corrosion at anodic conditions. 
Now, magnesium is interesting uh, because it is a very light uh, metal, and so we're in uh, all kind of lightweight application. It is uh, an alloying element that people would like to use. However, if one looks at the corrosion property of magnesium, it's kind of almost off the scale. It's extremely bad, and this is a problem. Um, it also exhibits a very strange corrosion behavior. Now, at a nodic condition, which means that magnesium is positively polarized, there is observed, apart from a very high corrosion rate, also the evolution of hydrogen, which is something which is completely counterintuitive and has puzzled people for more than 160 years. So um, we thought, okay, now we can maybe perform our calculation at a nodic condition, look what's happening, and we can really look at the electronic structure, at the atomic structure, maybe we can understand what's going on. So these are some details of the setup. And first, we did just the calculation without applying any voltage. Um, I so what uh, is left here is kind of the trajectories of some of the interesting atoms. Uh, water molecules trajectories are kind of blended out, and also the magnesium trajectories that are not interesting. Um, but what you can see here is that almost immediately we have kind of the dissociation of water and forming of OH group and hydrogen groups. And uh, for the time of our trajectories, we ended up with a coverage of one, quarter, uh, one third monolayer of hydrogen uh, of OH uh, on the surface, which is also consistent with uh, DFT calculations and uh, other calculations which just look kind of at uh, as, um, ground state uh, properties. Now, what happens when we make an, uh, magnesium more anodic? So basically, we make the material more positive, and this is, you can see, this is kind of our targeted voltage, the instantaneous voltage and the average voltage. We, one can see that we really nicely follow our targeted voltage, and this is the charge that we need to supply. Now, this is the same picture like the one I showed you before, but now really under anodic polarization, uh, anodically polarized magnesium, and you can see that much more is going on. So again, we have here dissociation of water in, and OH coverage. However, this time it reaches one monolayer. Um, what we see also that we form here uh, hydronium ion, which as expected would move to the neon side uh, and kind of screen to char the charts here. And what we were very excited to see is that we really see reaction and the formation of hydrogen molecules uh, within this um, system. Now, we looked at the kind of geometries that are associated with the formation of these hydrogen molecules, and here are a few snapshots from the MD. So what you can see here is a hydrogen uh, atom absorbed on the surface, which is uh, otherwise hydroxylated, and there is a water molecule approaching. The water molecule binds uh, hydrogen in a kind of unexpected geometry for people who are doing water, uh, because they usually don't expect that the hydrogen will bind to a hydrogen. And then there is a dissociation, the hydrogen molecules is formed, which then eventually leaves the surface while the OH dissolves. Now, this is a kind of reaction that has, uh, so this kind of reaction, this is what is written, um, is known, however, for a situation where we do have cathodic addition, where there, are, uh, um, there is a surplus of electrons at the surface. Now, here we are at electron deficient conditions because the magnesium is positive. So where does this electron come from? Uh, what we did is to look at the difference density of a surface um, without hydrogen, with uh, the neutral uh, hydrogen and just uh, the overall. And what we find is that hydrogen on this magnesium surface is negatively charged. So we don't have an additional electron that is coming somehow from the substrate, but actually the absorbed hydrogen is slightly negatively charged, and the reaction we have is this one here. And um, this kind of goes hand in hand with observation that we've made that magnesium behaves also in other cases a little bit weird because it has a very uh, high spill out at the surface and is very polarizable, uh, as we discussed in this work.
So with this, I think I'm at the end, and would, I hope I was able to show you that we were able to implement an up initio potential thought, which allows us to do uh, calculations for surfaces at applied uh, potential, and uh, this kind of opens really routes to look at questions which are difficult to address by experiment and really complement and get some understanding. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>